can you hear me well? Okay, I thank you so much, Victor, for yeah, for organizing this and for for being so kind and generous. Uh, in all the correspondences we've had so far, and you know, during the conference, I saw Anna briefly here, uh, who I met at a conference a few years ago. Um, and um, so I'm I'm also thankful for you know for for everything you've done uh, so far and. I'm I'm honored and excited to be here because this is the first time I'm presenting uh, some of my work in um, you know uh, at a conference that is organized in my native Skopje in Macedonia. So I am excited for that. Uh, the title of my presentation is Godard's Chromatic Fabric, and um, if I can share my screen, I prepared a presentation um, just mostly to show you some screenshots and stills, I guess from. <laughs> Can you see it? Okay. Uh, from uh, you know Godard's Godard's work because I will be talking about yeah a lot of color. So um, I'll begin. Um, in um, in 1965, uh, the French film journal Cahier du Cinéma, interviewing Jean Luc Godard, noted, "We see a lot of blood in Pierrot Le Fou." Godard's response: "It's not blood; it's red." Is often cited. If this response is still compelling, it is in part because the images in Marshall's in our thoughts challenge the logic of how color or the chromatic medium operates within a given narrative. Very early, even in his black and white films, such as Les Carabiniers from 1963 and Bande à part from 1964, Godard features references to color film. In Les Carabiniers, this, this reference comes from, okay. Uh, this reference comes from the two main characters, provincial soldiers, Michelange or Michelangelo and Ulysses, who increasingly go mad from being in an absurd war. At some point in the film, they exclaim they deserve to own Hollywood's Technicolor plant and other valued riches such as coal and oil. In a famous scene, they come back home and bring a suitcase full of postcards from around the globe, one of them being the MGM Technicolor building. This scene and the whole film more generally draw attention to a larger industrial and warfare apparatus that produces technologies and circulates images, including film color as a novel commercialized image and technology on a global scale. Additionally, as Michelange and Ulysses acquisition seem to show, circulation of images, war and film technologies such as Technicolor meet keenly at the juncture on the level of the cinematic image. Bande à part, another black and white film, similarly orients us towards color filmmaking in its connection to commerce, consumption, and uneven processes of modernization. The film ends by showing the two main characters, Franz and Odile, sailing off on a boat to unknown exotic lands. The sequel to their story, as Godard tells us in a voiceover, will be recorded in Technicolor and Cinemascope. This final scene shows a rotating globe reminiscent of the logo of a studio company from Hollywood's golden age, such as Universal Studios. But the spinning globe in Godard's sequence doesn't have any production company name nor logo attached to it, which makes it look disjointed in relation to the rest of the film, as if Godard wanted to show us an image of the world, untainted by any consumerists and ideological dogmas. This critique is consistently present throughout Godard's work, taking color technologies as a formal element that negotiates cinema's relation to the global film industry, history, and its status as an image machine that produces stories. However, Godard's experiments with color also orient us to consider color's effective, sensory, and epistemological heterogeneity. Since the 1960s, when color, uh, uh, color film cameras proliferated in Europe, but that continued to experiment with a palette of vivid and saturated hues. Whether this was on a tight budget film or in higher funded Technicolor films like Contempt. In many of his films, the function of color comes to exceed and even undermine its realist and referential capacity. Consider, for instance, the provocative choreography of red paint that overflows this, uh, the scenes of revolutionary bloodletting and consumerist revulsion in The Weeknd, which is shown here. The primary colors, intense red and blue, painted over the protagonist's face in Pierre Le Fou as he ushers into suicide. Or his later works like Le Livre d'Image, the image book, 
where we can see his continual work as a cinematic painter in which he incorporates video and digital images of a saturated and hallucinatory dissolution of a film strip. Overly symbolic or exceeding value, the colors in Godard's work materialize a distortion of the concrete world depicted in the films. They unsettle the narrative composition and enable new optics, forces, and lines of light to emerge. In what follows, I will take a few case studies from Godard's innovations with color and examine the way this chromatic aesthetics reconfigures new ways of looking, listening, and writing with images. If chromaticism characterizes not only a space of intensity, but also waxing and waning across the scale and gamut of nuances, what kind of political images do color tonalities enable in his films? What kind of movements, appearances, and perceptions does chromaticism project? I will first discuss chromaticism in existing theoretical context to show you my intervention. Expanding on Godard's experiments in part two, I will focus on his inspiration from the colorful Hollywood musical and its construction of dream worlds and utopian longing. Another inspiration I focus on in part three comes from comic books, a popular low-brow genre in which mass printed and color infused images, as well as separations of text and image distort the realist presentation of a world. My argument is to show how Godard's chromatic fabric renders visible not only the world of historical and political tension depicted in the films, but also acts as a metamorphic power, signaling an active and unrealized force of resistance to the current oppressive structures of this world. In scholarly discussions of um, filmic and modernist experimentalism, Color is underexplored, indeed often overlooked. One possible reason for this lack lies in the alignment of color with childhood, with the life of emotions, as well as with, with historically oppressed cultural modes, such as the feminine, the racialized, the exotic, the melodramatic. In philosophy, color has been a contested subject of inquiry. In the Aristotelian tradition, it appears as a conflict between color and line, wherein the primacy is attributed to line. In Kantian aesthetic thought, color is subordinate to cognition, reason, and ideas. Goethe and the Romantics dedicate much discussion to the subjective perception of colors. In his 1810 philosophical essay, Theory of Colors, Goethe writes that colors, quote, belong entirely or in a great degree to the subject and to the eye itself, end of quote. And in 1914, Walter Benjamin, writes a brief essay, A Child's View of Color, where he points out that, quote, for the person who sees with a child's eye, color is not a layer superimposed on matter, end of quote. In his vision, the experience of color is not oriented towards an erratic end, but rather presents itself as open, allowing for minimal variation and new arrangements of perceptibility. In Gilles Deleuze's two monumental works, Cinema One, the movement image, and Cinema Two, the time image, published in 1983 and 1985, respectively, the philosopher examines, examines color through what he calls the color image. As an image of effective tonality, the color image presents a passage between worlds or a movement of worlds. Deleuze develops this notion through a, discussion, through a discussion of an area of media, from painting to multimedia lithography, and compellingly through the filming genre of musical comedy and auteur Hollywood filmmakers like Vincent Minnelli. As he explains, the color image emerges when suddenly, through a change of color and light, we are transported from a concrete scene in the film into the dream world of a character. Deleuze writes that in the dream world, quote, Color is a dream, not because the dream is in color, but because colors are given a highly absorbent, almost devouring value, end of quote. This movement of worlds from the diegetic world of the film to a dream world is inseparable, Deleuze tells us, from the splendor, the potency of color itself. In these moments, like in the musical numbers in Minelli, color ceases to be referential and becomes a force in and of itself. One of the films that largely inspired my thinking about color in cinema is Godard's first color film and his only musical, A Woman is a Woman, from 1961. Unlike the American musical, which displays a utopian, all-encompassing dream, 
In Godard's musical, dreams are suspended and detached and non-assimilating color images create an atmosphere that is both tender and menacing. For example, one scene shows the main character Angela in a musical striptease performance baited in saturated red, pink, and blue color projected with filters. The trio of filters here is reminiscent of the industrially produced three-strip three color film. Godard's scene suggests that color technologies are a commercial product of cinema, buttressing the ideology of capitalist modernization. But lingering over Angela's face in a hallucinatory glow, such disjunctive color images, threading the line between reality and imagination, between dream and nightmare, also create a palpable atmosphere, a space to be felt. With their intoxicating multisensory potency, they combine new forces with irreconcilable desires of a profound vital intuition, as Deleuze puts it, telling us that there is more to this world than the oppressive world of post-war modernization, gendered labor, and consumerism in which Angela is caught. Godard's experimentation with color also recalls the postmodern pastiche aesthetics of mass printed graphicacy and comic strip, comic strip inscriptions in the style of pop art, uh, pop art artists such as Roy Lichtenstein. Pierre Le Fou, for instance, can be said to incorporate what Frederick Jameson called the flatness and serial apparitions of bright monochromatic worlds that resemble bubbles of slogans or short catchy sentences. Such aesthetics explicitly refers to the political and historical events in late capitalist consumerist culture, which is similarly offered up for the viewer's consumption as a deathless, emotionless, and ahistorical commodity. In Pierre Le Fou, we see the world of the film colliding with real political and historical events and the world of mass media and comic strips. And here I would like to show you um, a clip so if um, do time to play it. Okay, can you can you see the clip? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Um, so the two main characters here, Marianne and Ferdinand, or Pierrot, embark on a frenetic road trip during which they bring with them an album of the popular comic strip produced in colonial era, Le Pied Nicolet, title which refers to the French idiom, nickel plated feet, meaning slackers. A few scenes in the film portray the characters carrying the comic book under their arms while crossing rivers by foot, resting on the beach or running away after setting a car on fire. And we see them here resting on the beach <laughs> with the comic book. As in several of Godard films, comic book elements affect the formal aspect of the film cinematography. For example, we see written text over the images often dominated in primary vivid colors. Similarly, exclamations in voiceover and close-up images of the comic are juxtaposed with diegetic dialogue and scenes in the film. In some scenes, the use of monochromatic filters creates a splash field effect, as in comics, and in others, non-assimilating colors circulate in an inorganic way within the composition of the image. Recent studies have explored the theme of imperial conquest and colonial past in comic books like Les Pieds Nicolet in which the trio of French slackers sets off to pursue criminal adventures in non-European lands while casually interfering with imperial exploits, including the trans-African and trans-Asian expeditions, as well as with historical events, such as the 1931 colonial exposition in Paris and the expedition Citroën, the Black Cruise, which took place during the height of France's colonial empire in Africa. Numerous parallels can be made between the criminal adventures of the slackers and the proliferating political events, such as the aftermath of the decolonial wars that are contemporaneous with Pio Le Fou. Incorporating and transforming various episodes from the comic book, Godard has painted a new kind of cinematic image, one of intensified color and circulating cliches, as Gilles Deleuze describes it. In this cinematic gesture, Transferable images become the raw material of cinema, 
whose metamorphic powers circulate at the horizon of its color images. As, a, as episodes from the past return transformed and distorted into the colors of Godard's film, so do the potentials of other seen, dreamed, feared, and unrealized worlds. To conclude, I want to show you an example of uh, Godard's later experimental video essay, Histoire du Cinema, in, in which reflections about his experiments with color in cinema can be understood as extending this critique of the interaction of fiction, historical consciousness, and politics that Godard was developing in his earlier films, such as A Woman is a Woman and Pierre Le Fou. In a sequence of Histoire du Cinema, in a voiceover, Godard explains that director George Stevens was right to film the liberation of the World War II camps and its terrors in 16 millimeter color film, after which he filmed his following fiction uh, feature, A Place in the Sun, uh, in 1951 in black and white. Godard says, that in the, says this in the following voiceover, contrasted with a superimposed image of Elizabeth Taylor from A Place in the Sun. And if George Stevens hadn't used his first color film in Auschwitz and Reverend's book, Elizabeth Taylor would have never found a place in the sun." End of quote. For Godard, Stevens' fiction film in black and white is haunted by the memory of the color documentary that he shot six years prior in the concentration camps. This movement across historical and fictional worlds is often articulated formally in Histoire du Cinéma through Godard's use of superimposition, reverse shot, and depth of field, suggesting a point of view encompassing multiple times projected onto an expanding, absorbing space. In contrast to Godard's early cinema, the colors in his later films are often disintegrated and dissolving, or oversaturated and overexposed, showing the passage of a point of view between irreducibly heterogeneous times and worlds and allowing for potentialities unactualizable in one world to be thought and developed by passing into another. As in his, his early films, such moments of chromatic aesthetics continue to engage in political, historical, and ethical critique that comments on the norms of production, distribution, and circulation of images in the modern period. Thank you.